Thank you for joining and welcome to another Lead Dev Staff Task webinar. Lead Dev is a global community of engineering leaders who come together to discuss all things leadership, teams, tools, tech, and career development. Staff Task webinars is a monthly event that occurs on the first Wednesday of every month. During these webinars, we discuss the various roles and challenges faced by very senior individual contributors. As speakers, we share, the, we share the leadership skills they employ to scale their impact across their organizations. We hope that you gain useful insights to, get, to take back to your own role. So if you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Write them in the Q&A function and we'll either get to them during the webinar or afterwards in the Lead Dev Staff Plus Slack channel. My name is Blanca Garcia Gill, and I will be your host for this discussion. I'm a former principal engineer with experience across the data stack, and I am now an independent data consultant. I'm passionate about learning, and you can find me on Twitter at Blankish. Before we get started, I'd like to mention that LeadDev is hosting a two-day Staff Plus conference for senior ICs in London, which will run alongside LeadDev London on June 27 and 28, 2023. This is the first time that the Staff Plus conference will be held in London and it's already sold out. However, the Staff Plus workshop passes are still available and will be hosted by seasoned technology leader, Pat Kwa. To find out more about the workshop on leading without authority as Staff Plus engineer and lead Dev's Staff Plus Berlin conference in December, please visit www.leaddev.com events. Hello everyone. And a huge thank you for joining us today for a discussion on how to better understand business context as a staff plus engineer. This webinar is gonna last roughly for 45 minutes, after which both myself and the panelists will head over to the lead desk Slack to answer some of your questions in the hashtag staff plus channel. We may also have time to answer a couple of questions live. So please do submit those through the Q&A feature on Zoom and we'll get to them if we can towards the end. So, Let's get started with some introductions. My name is Blanca, and today I'll be joined by Ainsley, Hannah, Jason, and Omer to share their experiences and insights. I'll ask each of you to introduce yourself. Let's go in alphabetical order. Could you please answer in 60 seconds who you are and what makes you excited about being on the panel today? Ainsley, could you go first? Thanks. Hey everyone, I'm Ainsley. Uh, I am a staff engineer at Stripe um, on the developer productivity team. So that's the team I lead. Uh, we're a team of around 100 engineers, uh, and our sole mission is to make engineers at Stripe more productive and ideally happier as well. Um, why I'm excited to be here, I, I think understanding business context is A, specifically really important for my role. Uh, our goal is to make the company go faster. And if you don't know where the company is going, that's a heck of a lot harder. Um, and second, I think it was probably one of the biggest transitions from being um, a non-staff engineer to a staff engineer for me, uh, thinking way more about how my, my role fits into the broader context of the company and uh, less so just about, you know, what, what shipped I did, you know, last week. Uh, so that's me. Amazing. Thank you. I'm bang on. Uh, and now Hannah. Hi, I'm Hannah, and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a staff engineer at Slack in the cloud experience team. And I'm uh, just really happy to be here because this is my first lead dev uh, panel. So thank you so much for having me. Amazing. And welcome, Hannah. And I hope you enjoy it. Uh, next up, uh, Jason. Hi, I'm Jason. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. And I'm a actually a developer advocate at Carrot, but until recently, I was our staff engineer. Um, I was the first staff engineer here at Carrot. And so I'm really interested in this because this type of understanding of business context was one of the big questions we had of, as we built out the role, what does a staff engineer do? Why do we need one? Why, as we're growing, is it helpful to bring somebody in who has a different shape of role than all the other engineers? And I'm pleased to say we've grown out the staff engineering function enough that I was able to step away from it and go pursue this dev relations thing that I find really exciting. So I'm very excited to be here. Fantastic. And I'm sure that would be also very helpful for other organizations building that kind of senior staff kind of uh, career track. Let's, let's go now to Omer, your know, last but not least. <laughs> yeah. Hi, so uh, I'm Omer. I'm the principal engineer. I'm a principal engineer at Forder. Uh, we provide a suite of trust-based tools for e-commerce. 
And I personally lead the payments optimization product line, uh, which is all about making sure us trustworthy folks actually succeed in buying the things that we want to buy. Uh, lots of really exciting, really groundbreaking stuff there. Uh, you can find me at Omer VK pretty much anywhere. And I'm excited about, uh, well, first, learning from everyone on the panel. Lots of experience here. And secondly, uh, this is a topic that's honestly just assumed to come naturally to staff plus engineers. And now we're opening it up for discussion, which is something that I really appreciate. Thank you. Uh, well, Ainsley already kind of hinted that understanding business context is actually one of the key skills that staff plus engineers need to work on. It helps us be more effective by being able to prioritize the right work, but also sharing that context with the teams we work in with also helps sets them up for success. So for our panel today, we're gonna break this understanding business context into two separate areas. First, how do you get that business context and how do you kind of keep that up to date? Because it kind of changes over time. It's not a static thing. And the second part, the more interesting is how do you apply it in this role? We're also going to be framing the questions under the scope of efficiency, which is kind of the, that top focus for all organizations in 2023. So prioritization and doing all of this in order to meet those yearly business goals. So onwards to the first topic, I'm going to start with Jason. So what is, what is your approach to gathering business context? So my approach has always started from people. Um, talking with people is the key to understanding business context because usually business context isn't well written down somewhere or the parts of it that are, are lagging behind. So I always want to know who are the people who are building the business context, who are the people that are actually talking to customers, figuring out the strategy. And then I want to, I want to be their friend. Um, one of the big things that that I found is just going in and being somebody in engineering who is very approachable. Um, I try not to be, you know, I, I try to never make people feel like they are they are less than for not having all the engineering context that we have in engineering. But also, I want to them to share with me the business context, and I try not to feel stupid when I ask questions about, you know, I have asked about so many acronyms that I've had to unpack because. <laughs> Every discipline has their own language and, you know, they have jargon just like we do. So coming in and just ex accepting that I'm a real expert in my space, but I need them to carry me through theirs so that we can be good partners. Uh, but it, it's all about people for me. All about people. Really good start. Now, Hannah, um, so Jason has described relationships. How do you identify who you need to get in touch, you know, with to get this information and, and how do you kind of get that foot in the door? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, first, ask yourself who has um, who is in your organization, your department or pillar. You can look at your uh, workday HR org chart or something similar and see who are their peers as well. And ask around to see, do they host office hours? Uh, do they have an open calendar policy? Who are their executive assistants? And reach out to them to see if you can get time on their calendar. And also see what they're involved with, uh, involved with because the SVPs and VPs here at uh, Slack, they're also involved in employee resource groups or other projects. And if those projects align with uh, what you value, that might be a great natural way to meet them and form a relationship that way. Um, and personally, I meet with my VP every two weeks and my SVP every three weeks. And I informally meet with other VPs and SVPs in uh, other departments uh, every quarter. So after this call, I'll post sample messaging that you could use that um, for reaching out to someone remotely, uh, something similar like, hi, I'm a technical lead on XYZ team and want to ensure we're prioritizing our work in alignment with our business goals. And I would love to get on your calendar to discuss how our team can help deliver greater impact to the organization? Can we set up time next week for XYZ minutes? So I'll post that sample messaging after this call. That is really actionable. Thank, thank you so much. And any, any other thoughts uh, from others in the call that you'd like to add to Hannes? Are you also like so methodical? Because it sounds very methodical. You look at the org chart, you're gonna build a stand, but that is something that everyone can take home. 
and apply? Or do you, are you more informed and just kind of go about? I, I would say my, my, I'm a little bit more informal, but I think it kind of has a lot of the same uh, outcomes. I think um, one thing is uh, kind of as Jason was saying, when you have these personal relationships with people, they're, they're also often going to introduce you to the right people or say like, hey, you should talk to this person, you should talk to that person. And so you can kind of build up that, that, that network the exact same way because um, sometimes uh, a particular business structure isn't represented accurately in the org chart, like someone might be like responsible for something and it's not super clear. Um, and sometimes you just get something kind of unexpected and, and those are always kind of like serendipitous and really cool as well. Uh, that's a really great point, Ainsley. And I think one thing that's that's sometimes we are a bit embarrassed to ask, just ask those social hubs, those people who know people, who should I be talking to? This is the thing that I'm interested in. And they'll point you in the right direction because they know so many people. There are so many people like that in every org. Yeah, we, so, we, we used to call them hype cook, hype for connectors, I think. Yes. Find one and you're in luck. <laughs> also, advertise your interests. Like if there's whatever your area is, just make sure that you're saying it in, you know, in big public Slack channels, in if there's company meetings where you introduce yourself, introduce whatever your area of interest is and encourage folks who are interested in that area to reach back out to you because... You won't know all the right people to reach out to, but if you just kind of put a big flashing sign on yourself being like, hey, talk to me about these things, people will. That's a really good tip, Jason. Uh, now let's, let's go on to Omer. Uh, so you've gathered this initial information, but months down the line, and sometimes even weeks down the line, things change. So how do you keep up to date with this change in information? So that's a, that's a great question. It's really not trivial. And I can share what works for me. Uh, a lot of it has been alluded to in this conversation so far. There are two uh, two things that need to be done. One is pull, another is push. So first, you want to pull information. You want to be in the right forums. You want to be in the right Slack channels. You want to be in the right email group email groups. And it's not not trivial how to find them, but incrementally you will. Uh, you can ask which ones are the right one, right ones, and ask people to just add you. Um, you want to be in the right planning meetings. That is, you want to hear what's coming up in the future in multiple forums, uh, in the team or teams that you're working with, in the group, in the product and engineering teams where they plan ahead for like the next quarter or two quarters or a year or whatever. Um, it's important that you were even uh, a fly on the wall there and you can listen in. And if it's recorded, you can watch the recording later. Uh, another thing that you can do to pull information is to keep regular one-on-ones with your stakeholders. Uh, that's in engineering, that's in product. Uh, security uh, might also be interesting. Um, sometimes even sales would be an interesting, like every month or two months, just to sit down with the right salespeople and hear what they're thinking about, pick their brains, and most importantly, just listen. Um, the other side of the equation is getting information pushed to you, uh, which, which just means, and, and Jason has, has talked about this, just be available to others. Make sure that they know that they come, can come to you, make sure that they know that they can talk to you and that you will be useful to them. You can give them feedback, you can give them insights from your perspective, you can provide more context to them and be open about your plans as well, because you're not the only one thinking, how do I gather business context? They're all thinking the same thing, right? Openness is contagious and caring about others and, and them being successful at what they do is also contagious. So that's what works for me. Um, amazing. Uh, what, what do you know, what, what do the first thing? Uh, there's, there's a lot that Omar has said. Any, any other challenges you can think of? I guess I'll, I'll, I'll summarize. So, Omar, you kind of broken this down into kind of three, another three skills. Uh, one of them is kind of spending time making sense of all of this business context. You know, it sounds like a lot of kind of understanding and putting things together. Then there's this relationship management as well, that you kind of have to keep the relations and you kind of have to almost have your own map for who you need to catch up with. And you can follow Hannah's kind of templates. And so you kind of set up. And then the, the other one is kind of carving out time in your calendar. So people can go to you. So I guess one one way would be signals. The other way would be, hey, these are my office hours. So people can have a foot can put a foot in the, your door as well, isn't it? 
Yeah, exactly. And and one thing that really worked for me is telling people their story from your perspective. Like, mm -hmm. this is something that you've just told me this, and now I'm going to tell you how it sounds to me from my context, from my perspective, it really mm -hmm. helps the conversation, makes keeps it going. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jason? Uh. Super tactically on that, I found... As an engineer, I had never thought about keeping like a, a Google Calendar invitations link or like a Calendly link or something where other people can just put time on my calendar with a structured system. Uh, but it turned out to be so useful of just, here is time, you can book it, it's yours. You don't need to show up at an office hour and negotiate with whoever else is there. Just throw a slot on my calendar and there's no question about whether you'll get it. Even though I would say to everybody, oh, you can put time on my calendar whenever, if it's free, you can have it giving them an invitation link they could use just felt like giving them permission and like, oh, this time has been set aside for that. Absolutely. Omar? I just want to share that that this being open and being in inviting is a very cultural, uh, has a very cultural aspect where I've had people I've worked with uh, in the US and UK send me like a, a whole huge amount of text saying, I want us put time on your calendar to discuss this. Uh, whereas my colleagues in Israel will just put a slot in whenever they want, sometimes conflicting with other things, no agenda whatsoever. And, and they're sure I'll say yes, because, you know, it's obvious, right? So yeah, that's, so. <laughs> I didn't that's even think about, advice. at Jason, I didn't even think about putting like time slots and, and anything like that, because it just... The secret is my actual time <laughs> slot is I've got it set. The bookable time is literally my working hours in half hour increments. So if there's a time on my calendar, you can book it. But just having the link gives some people permission and makes them feel more okay doing it than literally you can book any time during my working hours. That's it's the same tip. thing, ultimately. Yeah, That's a great tip. Yeah, I think it's a great tip because I one of the, one of the things I've heard a lot uh, from people in the orgs I work with is they assume that when you you are focused in your in your work that you are busy and you're unavailable. It's almost like those two things, you know, kind of create a distance. So I, I think putting forward those hours, it, it kind of says, yes, I'm here for you if you need me. Okay, so I think, you know, give, given the time that we have with this webinar, let's let's move to the second topic because I think it's really interesting. The, the part of applying the information to our also teams. Okay, uh, so only we're gonna go back you and uh, I know you have a great example that what you learned from the business that there was a team you were working with that was about a split and what did you apply what did you do with, with this with this business knowledge in that situation uh, thanks Blanca I'm, I'm very happy to share that example um, so uh, a team I'm still working with uh, mm -hmm. we were planning ahead for the coming year uh, there was a lot of uh, it, it's already a large team right? It's focused on multiple different products in the product line. Um, and we looked ahead and we saw that in the coming year, we expected a lot of growth in all the areas they were, they were working on, the main areas, especially. And the amount of growth of, of, of a number of people meant that they would have to split because it would be untenable to keep them as a single team. Um, that meant that we had about a year be before, you know, we had to ramp up hiring and we have to ramp up like um, uh, educating people and onboarding them and so on. So considering that it, it was going to be split and I tried to take Conway's law into account and we took our, um, our code base and we made a modular monolith where we had very clear lines where we can just break the monolith into two or three, whatever, how many teams we'll need so that they can work independently. Now, uh, the split hasn't occurred yet, but uh, it's okay. also <laughs> providing us with a lot, with a lot of, of value. Um, and that's really also something that I have to, to mention. We always have to keep in mind that the business context we know might just not happen, that the plans might not happen, that things will change. So that decisions that we take based on the context that we know, we should take uh, into account whether that we want to have them re be reversible. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think your example is so wholesome because it kind of brings together that how we code, how we organize, you know, the projects that we work with, with, with something that is kind of quite intangible at the start. 
yeah. going into into change, uh, we're going to move to Hannah uh, because yeah, I think I think wanted to share something on how 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 do you adapt to these kind of changes in business priorities? Like you, you were working towards something, and another example, and then you learned that that you know that has changed. And how do you learn from this and kind of make sure it kind of doesn't happen again in the future? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, preparation is really key. So in your quarterly planning or in your roadmap planning, make sure you set a time as a buffer for these unexpected events because they will happen. If you're consistently committing to a full schedule every time, you're not setting yourself up for success. And if you see something that doesn't map back to your company business goals in your planning session, ask why that work is being prioritized. And usually project managers will know um, for what reason this has been sent or um, why it's being prioritized now and have an honest conversation with them and understand where it's coming from. Um, for how to address um, doing not doing these kind of behaviors in the future, examine the last time this happened to you. What kind of trade-offs did you make? Uh, who made those decisions? And who was involved from the engineering level to the project management level to the VP level? Do you have uh, relationships with any of these people? And if not, then you should start building those relationships now. They're the people that you really need to sync up with. For us at Slack, we consistently have check-ins with other team leaders, whether that is managers or technical leads, we share roadmaps with each other very frequently. We meet with each other about once a month and work collabor collaboratively to share any blockers, um, any unexpected results and kind of learn from each other. And so that's a great uh, tip for those who aren't doing that already. I, I love this. It's almost like you're kind of debugging that decision-making process so that in the future, you, you will see that decision kind of coming from the distance, isn't it? Like it should not be technically a surprise you know very few decisions in an org are a surprise really okay mm. that's, a, that's a good one and anyone else uh here has any other insights Jason? there's something that uh, they both said that i think fits in that you you notice usually where that decision came from if you kind of track back into why something has been prioritized and i found that there's generally a lot of use in then build connections with whatever venue that decision came from, because usually that means that that's something that that was a blind spot you had about where business context is coming from. Like, oh, this was prioritized because of this group. Why didn't you hear about it from that group? Probably you weren't connected to that group yet. Uh, and sometimes it's, oh, it turned out to be nothing. But a lot of the time when you see that, if you build stronger relations with wherever it came from, that also makes you resilient to knowing about it in the future. Wow. Yeah, it's, Another thing to keep, another one, you know, the things that you need to keep keep in mind here. Okay, so we're going to move to Ainsley. Uh, I, I noticed you you've been a, a bit quiet. I think so. How how do you use that information uh, to make decisions on you know prioritization? You know what projects you need to kind of invest in, and what do you get more closely involved with? Yeah, for sure. Um... So I think uh, one of the things that I think a lot of us kind of feel is, is that uh, the companies have a, definitely have a different approach to hiring now than they did, I, I think, in like, you know, 2021, 2022. Um, and, and that makes prioritization a lot more important. I think uh, there was a, a point where during our planning cycles, I think things were a lot less contentious because when we move something below the cut line, we would basically just be like, oh, you know, that's something we'll like hire for in the future or we'll definitely get to that. You know, like no one ever felt like they were truly, you know, trading off or giving up something. Um, but now I, I find that we have to be a bit more judicious because we are genuinely saying like we're we're not we're explicitly choosing to not do this for the foreseeable future because we're going to do something else. Um, and for us, you know, uh, on the developer productivity kind of side of things, uh, if our goal is to uh, you know accelerate the business, um, as when we're making those those really important decisions about where we invest our time, we're kind of de facto saying where we're going to try and accelerate the business right and where we're going to like perhaps let that team uh do things under their own under and under their own steam um and so one of the things i tend to think about is like it's not anymore it's not just about like what are the number of people that we're affecting for example when we build this tool it's which projects are we going to accelerate and how important are those projects to the business um there's this really uh I think interesting example that happened recently where someone came to me and they're like, oh, we really, really need this, this uh, like kind of like super low level piece of infrastructure, this client. And I was like, okay, uh, 
that sounds interesting, but like, I, I don't really, once, I didn't actually understand once again, how it fit into the business context until um, I had a conversation with someone else, uh, kind of, as we talked about a super connector who connects me to the right person. And I understood all of the other projects that were sitting on top of this project, um, which eventually led to like a really, really important product team. It was kind of like a database client, which unblocked a database upgrade, which unblocked mm -hmm. this team being able to use transactions and transactions were a super important part of this product that they were trying to ship. Um, and if I didn't have that connection, um, I, you know, I probably would have made the wrong prioritization decision, which is thinking of this as like a cool, interesting technical side project as a part to like a critical linchpin of, of, of a business goal that the company had. Yeah, totally. So it's almost like you, you're now are digging into kind of project dependencies and feature dependencies across multiple projects. It's exactly. Like, ah. Okay. Oh, and can I can I ask you yes to follow up because you were saying when you prioritize things, uh, I I assume you have to kind of liaise with with the teams that you work with, with the engineering managers, and just kind of line everyone up. It's not like you gather this, you make that decision, and then everyone just kind of follows through. Then you have to kind of communicate it downwards, isn't it? Yeah, so, so uh, at least with our team, we actually have this thing called customer advisory boards. Um, and so there are, you know, uh, we, we have these on a bigger scale, for example, you know, like uh, we're a customer of AWS and we'll go to AWS's customer advisory board. But we do that, so we replicate that same process internally because there are a lot of teams around Stripe who are our customers. And so we will sit down, uh, sit down with them. We're actually doing a bunch now because we're about to start H2 planning. And we'll be like, hey, uh, here is our roadmap. Here's what we're thinking of doing. Uh, how does this fit in with what your team actually needs from us? Um, how have you been experiencing our, like what we've actually worked on over the last half and just having that back and forth conversation. And then we're going to synthesize all of that context. And, and once again, at, at the end of the day, like not everyone is going to be happy uh, because we have limited resources, but having those customer advisory boards lets us much uh, better understand the trade-offs that are actually making between the different teams. Mm -hmm. Totally. Hannah? One thing that we haven't explicitly stated is how we involve our teams with these prioritization discussions. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's really important to recognize that as staff plus engineers, you're not making these decisions by yourself. You need to have these open conversations with your teams explaining, this is the business context. Um, this is why we're doing this. I would love to get buy-in from X, Y, and Z on the team. What are your thoughts? And have that open discussion. Uh, I just really want to emphasize, I think, we as staff engineers know that this is not a decision uh, process that we make by ourselves, but we often bring in our teams and other teams to discuss. Uh, just like Ainsley said, with a, you know, a collaborative process or a board to review, it's really important that we um, as staff plus engineers recognize that um, and bring our teams along for the ride, especially if we want to grow them into staff level engineers. Right on point, Hannah. Thank you. Omar? Uh, I just want to say I fully agree with what Hannah, Hannah said. It's a great point. I think it's also really important that you want to take the uh, team members who are growing to be staff plus engineers. You want to provide them with as much context as they would need to perform their duties to actually go ahead and make those decisions or lead those projects and, and set them up for success, which is part of, part of, part of our jobs. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. I agree with you. I, I kind of see the staff, the staff plus engineers as almost like a facilitator for decisions. You kind of communicate that context and you kind of have an idea in mind of what decision or what prioritization, but you need to kind of bring people along because otherwise, if they are not in that decision making process, they are only kind of almost following what has been said and they have really no idea how to make any decisions about their day to day, isn't it? Jason? Yeah, this brings up that sometimes as a, as a staff plus engineer, one of the biggest things you'll do is you'll quietly tell folks that are more senior than you that you were involved in a decision and hopefully nobody realizes that because if you've done your work right, you simply gotten the right context to the right people that the correct decisions were made by folks who are growing, that the business is on the right track and that you are a strong endorser of this decision. You believe in it and you helped make sure everyone had the right information, but nobody should feel like you made that decision because even though you did and then you helped steer toward it, 
you what you really did was created the opportunity for the people in the organization to make the decision that you think is good or to make to give you back the context about why they made a different decision and have you come along with them for the ride. Yeah, no, I th- I think that's, you know, that's being an influencer and and not the Instagram type, you know, but being a true influencer in our roles. I I totally agree. Okay, Jason, we're going to move on to the next question. Uh going back to that kind of social connector idea that you mentioned earlier. You said there's there's a, there's a skill in becoming one. Yes. So how do you become that social connector? <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. The mention of hyperconnectors, I'm like the thing about looking for the hyperconnectors, that's never been what I do because I it's always very easy for me to look for them. I am them. Um, and the the way that I do it is very much about thinking about for everybody around me, what do they need? Like, what is the thing that is of value to them and how can I provide it? Uh, and for me, uh, this actually comes, it's comes a little bit out of disability. I have fairly strong ADD. Uh, I don't have great follow through and I'm not super organized, which are not great skills to have in our field. But what that means is that I want to set myself up so that in any moment I'm delivering value. And one of the ways I want to do that is by making sure that I'm giving people what they need that's in my head and gathering data as often as I can. So I want to build that map of the business, that map of who's doing what, even knowing I may not be able to act on it directly, I'm going to set myself up to go talk to other people to make sure that if they have a question, it can be answered. Uh, A lot of the time, I also set myself up as a bit of a, almost a telephone operator in the sense that a lot of people reach to me first, not because I'll know the answer, but because I will be able to redirect them in a single hop to the person who knows the answer. And in that, in doing that, I got to hear the question. I know what the context is of the thing that's happening. I often follow back up to find out what the answer was so that I can now the answer for people who come in with it again. But just injecting myself in that, kind of making myself the uh, the communication, uh, you know, the oil on the pan that makes everything slide around because I, I can't know everything. Um, I don't think any of us can, but being willing to be involved and being very willing to say like, I don't know, but let's find out together. And then you're in that conversation and you're a part of the connection. I I love that example. Like you you are gaining awareness of those unique skills that you have. It's just unique to you. And then you say, I can do this because I this is the way that I work. I think that's great. And I and I think it's also, you know, we have to reckon that staff plus engineers, they vary widely. There's not only one true set of skills, there's like a baseline of skills that we we're discussing. But you don't need to be like, you know, to 100 in all of them. Every one of us is kind of different levels on each one of them and applying your strengths to the things that you can really do be great at. I think that also makes you shine. So, so thanks for sharing that, Jason. I don't think I could be a social connector. <laughs> yeah, and and if, the, if it's not who you are, like, don't aim for it. Figure out who to connect to that that is. Um my, the other staff engineers in my organization are not. That's not what they do. But like one of the other staff engineers in my organization has, we have a monolith and he has the monolith in his head. If you ask him, what is the set of interactions that are that happen along this type of a business path? Chances are with 20 minutes, he can tell you because he has a, just a great context of the application. I don't have that. I I have a great context of the organization. So we know when to call each other in. Fantastic. And I think I, because we have a bit more time, I have not seen any questions from our audience yet. We're going to pop over some some questions on, you know, going back to kind of how you gathered that concept, or kind of rewinding a little bit, you know. And going, we, we kind of touched a bit on opening your door, you know, and people coming to you. But how, how do people know what they can reach you? reach to you for how do you kind of make them known like these are the projects or this is the domain these are the skills these are the things that I help you with it's almost like your your kind of your CV kind of first paragraph like these are the, the skills this is me you know my, my main thing how do you let them know that Omer or, or, or you know Jason would you like to have a stab at that yeah, so so I think first of all you want to have a clear understanding what 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 your role even is. Right, you want to understand, uh, have a good uh, story around that. Um, you want to explicitly share. This is where you come to me 
for what you come to me for, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is how I can help you. Um, it's it's also about like taking the time and talking to the people and and identifying them, uh, the people you want to be in touch with, uh, sitting down with them for a coffee, um, just getting to know them, not even in a business context, just understand who they are, uh, what they're interested in, um, share who you are, what you're interested in, and 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 make sure that they understand that you are approachable because you approach them to say that you're approachable. <laughs> Saying hello to new people as they join the company, particularly senior folks. I have been just amazed at what I've gotten by just watching, uh, you know, looking at who the new hires are that are announced and especially folks that have some seniority in whatever they're doing or that are anywhere in the engineering organization. I reach out and say hello and just, you know, say, hi, you know, this is me. This is, I don't yet know what I can help you with, but here's what I do. Here's what I'm here for. And I'm a resource. So please, if you need something, especially as you're onboarding, but ever reach out to me, or, if, you know, I also want to know who you are. And it helps if you legitimately just like people and are interested in their stories. Um, that's really, I think it's a, it's a good skill to cultivate of just learning how to be interested in people, but it reaching out, I think, as Omar said, if you have said that you that you want to meet them, then it's really hard to fake. I want to meet you, so I set up time to meet you. Mm. Yeah, and 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 don't be too shy about it. Like they're they're also interested in meeting you because you're going to be pivotal in 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 the work that they will have to do. Like uh, I joined uh, a company for with hundreds of engineers and I uh, messaged the EA for the CTO and said, oh, I'm gonna be in town. Can I have like 30 minutes? And I'm, I felt like, you know, the, the, uh, the kid that was shouting like, oh, I, I really want to meet this big guy. And it's like, and she was like, yeah, sure, go ahead. And we sat down and we just had a chat about things. Uh, it was great. Then I got to know him, he got to know me. We had follow-up conversations and that's great. Yeah, it's definitely a muscle, a muscle to kind of flex. I, I've had, I had to do a lot of work, I'm, you know, not being the social connector. Inslee, I, I think you might want yeah, to add something. Uh I was going to say one uh, one cool pattern that I, I've seen at Stripe is sometimes uh, staff engineers write what they call personal charters uh, that they link to from their profile from their Slack. And, and it's just, just like normally this really honest document a bit about, you know, who they are, some background. So once again, if you do uh, want to go talk to them, it doesn't feel so immediately stilted and awkward, you know, like a little bit about them. Um, but also, I think primarily... Uh, kind of to, to, once again, what Jason was saying, like the, their strengths and weaknesses, putting them out there explicitly, like this is what I am good at, right? Like I am a deep technical architect who understands this portion of the system. And also uh, sometimes even more importantly, here's what I'm not good at. Like if you are looking for mentorship, that's possibly not something that I can give you if you're looking for a social connector or something like that. And that really helps people understand who you are um, and potentially, you know, once, if they need to come to you for something or also if they need help about something, if they can help you with something as well, it just kind of starts that that conversation and, and being really honest with people in that in that initial way. Um, I, I find like a really nice thing to do. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, that, that's helpful, taking in the context of kind of setting up a relationship. I'm, I'm, what, I, what I'm always kind of thinking is, does that kind of actually put some people off? Because they read that kind of that, proposal that manual and they're like oh yeah I know what this person does so I don't need to kind of catch up with them and I think it's almost like no this is the way that you reach out to me for one of the things I wanted to add here is that when I when I stepped into the principal engineer role the first time there were expectations on me that I kind of wasn't aware when I when I promoted because there was a big domain uh, in our data platform that was kind of left dangling there was kind of no clear owner so I had to kind of, at first, kind of just listen to people instead of kind of saying, this is what I'm doing. Almost like listen to people and kind of get gather what were they expecting me to focus on in my role. And, and that was, I found it very eye-opening because first of all, people kind of also told me what things they appreciated me for. But also I learned there was this kind of thing that this scary thing no one wanted to touch. And, and I was thought, well, I need to have a crack at this. And I, and I kind of basically, it told me what my main priority was at that time and I think that was super useful so I think we have five minutes and there's a couple of questions here if you know if we're all okay with with going on one is in the 
in the context of a consultancy, it says, does any of the advice change in the context of a consultancy when you don't own the product or really have a roadmap? You're adopting and executing on these for the client. Mm, I think, you know, my, my experience with, with consulting is th this is tricky because the client, they, they should have some sort of roadmap. You should still be spending regular time with your client kind of reviewing the roadmap, understanding is there anything changing? Because otherwise, you're just kind of left completely in the dark with things. You, you're just kind of being told what tasks to do. Uh, so for me, you still have to kind of keep the relationships even closer when you are a consultancy. Jason, do you want to add here? Uh, yeah, just that in, in that sort of an at arm's length position, one of the things that you need to do is sell to them the idea that them bringing you in provides value. Uh, ultimately, developers for all the, you know, we, we write code, that's not our job. Our job is really reducing ambiguity. We are the ultimate, we are where the rubber meets the road on ambiguity reduction of the computer does not tolerate ambiguity. So we are very good at taking it out. So the more that we are loaded with the context, the better we can do at our jobs. And I think sometimes when folks consult with developers, they, they see us as programmers, but what they really need to understand is we are actually problem definers. We're going to take your problem and understand it better than anyone does yet. And the more context you give us, the better we are. That's a really, really nice way to put it. I, I hope that was that was useful because this is another question that I talked about transitioning in, into a staff class role. And there's always, you know, things that you have to let go of in order to be able to take on other things. And and the question starts, it says, when transitioning into, into a staff class role, it can be challenging to resist the temptation of solving all the problems that arise. For example, when an issue arises and you possess a deep understanding of the system, it is natural to jump in and resolve it without giving other team members an opportunity to gain that knowledge. Additionally, it may be difficult to let go of projects that you have worked hard to build, but as you move into the role, you must transfer the responsibility for those projects to other engineers. How do you manage this problem during the transitioning phase? Would like to start. Anyone? No, <laughs> Jason, go on. I, I don't mean to, to dominate here, but uh, that first half in particular, the uh, the jumping in and resolving it. Um, I actually learned this from another staff engineer that I worked with when I was a dev manager uh, at Amazon. And one of the things that came up was when the problems would occur, because he had this temptation and he had to be coached on it. Uh, and one of the things that helped was when problems would occur, the question was, what is the consequence of not solving this problem immediately with the best possible answer? And if the consequence was not, everything goes terrible, then we then he should take a step back and try to help someone else get to the answer. And that helped him build up the credibility so that occasionally when the answer was, if we don't act immediately and decisively, everything's bad, he could just say, I need you to trust me. Right now we're going to do this. We'll take you along for the ride later. And that that trust that he built by helping other people along actually also made him more effective when it came to making the decisive decisions. This is great, Jason. Ainsley, I noticed you had your I, hand raised. I was thinking about it, but then Jason pretty much said everything I was going to. I was going to say I struggled with the exact same problem moving into this role. And yeah, mm -hmm. Jason just nailed the advice that I got. Okay. Omar? Just, uh, just become too busy with other things <laughs> so you can't spend the time and things just fall through the cracks and that's fine because people will catch them and uh, learning to let go of these things is super important mm. yeah yeah i had i went through, through a period that i i was kind of very deep into kind of our support rota okay and, and they were i i i love debugging issues okay life issues something that i kind of almost built my career on Okay, and I've learned so much, and it was it was really really hard to to step away from it because I knew our different code bases, our architecture, so I could kind of almost like help people along that. But then at the same time, it just stops you from growing at a certain level because you're so deep into the detail, you cannot see the rest. Okay, so so for me it was a question of well, I need to make time for all these important things that are not urgent. Because if I don't do them, no one else will. And people will come and ask me questions about them. 
But those other things are actually opportunities for growth for other engineers. So for me, it was kind of not just letting go, but also kind of learning to coach engineers to get them better at doing that. And in the process, like uh, you already highlighted, people actually gain trust in you. So, so I think it's kind of like a double, a double win. Okay, I kind of learned a new skill and also the engineers in my team learned, learned a new skill and it made us all together better. Um, so I think we're gonna ask one last question. Okay, and uh, it's a slightly off topic. Uh, someone just says, this is an incredible panel. So thank you, thank you for that. Uh, someone is saying, I'm an introvert and I consider myself a pretty good leader in one-on-one -on -one context and mentorship. So I lean into that. That works well until my calendar is completely full. And then I struggle to increase my effectiveness. Any tips? I think, Hannah, you might have some. Yeah, I 100% resonate with this. So there are a couple tips and actionable items I can give you. First, make sure you are scheduling time for yourself. So on your calendar, make sure you are scheduling. If you have a responsibility responsibilities like picking up kids or dropping them off at school, blocking that in. Um, time for wellness. So like exercise, lunch, things like that. And then see what your calendar looks like after you put yourself first. And then um, with your co commitments, make sure you analyze and see, okay, which of these things can be done async? If it's video calls, can you transition to audio only? And during that time, are you able to walk around your neighborhood, take the dog for a walk um, and kind of multitask that way? And then the th third um, thing I can tell you is as a staff plus engineer, you have to rely on other staff plus engineers in, in your org. So um, tr so try to see if you can introduce the people that um, you're mentoring to other mentors uh, that so that you don't have to take that burden on yourself. So those are the tips that I can provide you that worked for me. Yeah, I can relate to that as well. I, th I would say that uh, I'm also an introvert, uh, believe it or not. So for me, it's about if I have a day that is, for example, a morning that is all of meetings, sometimes I just have to insert a pause in between things because I just kind of need that alone time <laughs> for, for a little a little bit okay so don't be scared of saying people i need like 10 or 15 minutes to just kind of step out or to just read a book because i have been around people way too much and i think also knowing that about yourself it will also enhance your relationship with other people because people will be will understand what your boundaries are and it will also help them kind of say how they work best jason I'm not an introvert, but I do also lean very heavily into the one-on-one -on -one things. So just one other thing about the scaling is sometimes when you find you're not scaling, teach the skills to teach. So if you find that there's a thing that you're doing for a lot of people, see who in your organization would be a good leader to learn that stuff and start to teach them that and then steer people to them to learn it so that you can still help coach them. You know, if many people in your organization need to learn prioritization, take somebody who's already getting good at it teach them how to help other people with it and then start sending people to them to learn instead. Amazing. And I think we're going to now wrap up your art panel because I'm just down to the time. Can we quickly just go around the room and share what is, what is kind of that, that top skill that you had to kind of use to keep up with that kind of that business context and kind of learn to translate it? To your teams, if that makes sense, because we kind of highlighted a lot of skills along the way, some of them really personal to each of us. So if we can go now in reverse alphabetical order, so Omar, happy to go first. So just really simply listen and actively listen, just to push your listening onto others. Like, I don't know how to even explain that even better than that um and and it's it's important to, to remember that everything that you're you're hearing is is um going to potentially change and that's fine and take that into account thank you jason be willing to learn from everyone listen to all the things that you hear and try to come into everything with an attitude not of wait i know better than this but why do I think I know better than this? And then, because that'll make people more willing to talk to you and it'll also help you learn and change your mind quickly when somebody brings in new context that does change everything. Oh, I, I like that, being curious. Hannah? Yeah, practice being vulnerable because it's hard. It's gonna be awkward for you and the other person and uh, just 
practice putting yourself out there and don't be afraid to speak up. That's great. Ainsley? Um, and for me, I think it was about uh, kind of learning to accept that like building the relationships and having the relationships with people around around the company was part of my job, not like it was separate from my job. Um, I think realizing that, that that became part of the role at some point was really important to me. Amazing. And my tip, you've said already some of my tips, but my tip was flexing the muscle of reaching out to people and don't apologize for it. I work in, in the UK. Okay, we are always apologizing. Just don't apologize. Just, just ask for the time and then thank people later. So with that, uh, we're now we're going to, you know, close this off. Thank you for the insights for today's panel. Okay, we're all going to be jumping into the Slack. I think there are a couple more questions left that will be answered in the Slack. Okay, so please come to the hashtag StuffLess channel. Thanks for joining, and we hope to see you next time.